Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of June 21st, 2021. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 625 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages. Also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we explain our thoughts on how to resolve the current budget impasse. Second, we explain why we think, in its weekend editorial on fiscal issues, the ADN failed to live up to the standards of objectivity and balance usually expected of editorial boards. And third, we explain why, in a different way, we think Governor Dunleavy is becoming as unreasonable as Senator Von Imhoff on fiscal issues. And now... Let's join Michael. Well, a lot of stuff has happened, my friend, since last week. Uh, I mean, uh, whew, I don't know if you could see all this coming or not, but uh, it got pretty crazy. And uh, we've got, you know, we've, we've got some we've got some issues, Lucy, here. Well, I don't know what we need to do, but we're going to start off uh, with your ideas on the budget. You've seen what's happened. You've seen the inability of the legislature to come together the hostage holding of the minority this time it didn't go over well last time they blinked and uh, and caved to the arm twisting by Bert Stedman and company uh, this this time around they didn't and good good for them to show them that you can't negotiate with a terrorist uh, you've got number one on your list here as your proposal as to where you think we should go uh, on the budget let's uh, let's hit it well let me start by saying that uh that I'm impressed by the minority in the House uh, uh, in voting against the effective date and using that as a tool to uh, to keep the conversation going. Um, the votes on the effective date are are usually uh, locked in. Uh, all the debate is done before that, and uh, once you get down to the effect, you either win or lose on the issues in the budget. And once you get down to the effective date, um, and, and traditionally the CBR draw, um, uh, usually uh, uh, the debate's over and, and enough people vote to, to go on. Uh, last on last week's show, you know, you and I talked a lot about the CBR draw and the need to vote against that to keep the issues uh, in the reverse sweep live uh, going into the August session. Uh, I didn't anticipate the vote uh, against the effective date. Uh, but uh, I think it's a good demonstration of the of the hell no, we're not going to take it anymore uh, attitude that the minority has and was uh, an effective use of, of raising their issues. But now we've got the question of, of what we do eight days out from the end of the fiscal year, from the beginning of the next fiscal year. We've got the question of, um, of what we do. And uh, uh, the governor announced yesterday, there's been rumors about it before, but the governor announced yesterday he's going to drop a new budget bill uh, tomorrow uh, uh, at the start of the special session. Uh, and that's likely going to raise even more uh, issues about, uh, about where we're going from here. My understanding is the new budget bill uh, is going to be the conference committee, and I could be wrong about this, but my information is the new budget bill is going to be the conference committee report, but... Uh, redoing uh, some of the um, uh, uh, funding mechanisms that were included in the uh, uh, included in the conference committee report, um, for example, uh, uh, drawing the PFD out of the earnings reserve, which is where it's intended to come from, as opposed to from the right. CBR and other things. 
uh, and increasing the budget or increasing the PFD to the $2,300 uh, POMV uh, 50-50 proposal. That's going to you know, trigger the majority uh, who will oppose those things and uh, and will leave us with a, uh, with a state, and I assume will be supported by the minority, at least a lot of the minority, um, and it is going to trigger another sort of stalemate again uh, at that point, eight days out from the end of the fiscal year. My perspective is this. We're not going to solve the whole budget issue uh, in this budget. The reason we're not is revenues aren't on the table. Uh, and to solve this budget issue permanently, firmly, fully, uh, revenues are going to have to be on the table. And we'll talk about that in the second segment. Uh, but this budget, this the, the FY22 budget, can do a lot to uh, incentivize parties to come to the table in August, which is when we, when we need to resolve the, 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 the budget issues permanently can incentivize the various parties to come to the table uh, in August uh, uh, with, an, in, with a, an attitude of trying to get this resolved, not just, not just talking the game of trying to get it resolved, but with an attitude of trying to get it resolved. The problem, the problem up to this point, the problem the last five years, is that the, the burden has always been on the PFD, entirely on the PFD. And it's always and the and the solutions, the the year to year solutions, the ad hoc solutions, have always been put on the backs of, of middle and lower income Alaska families. Um, and I think I think so. So the majority thinks that's always going to be the resolution, and they have really no incentive to solve the issues long term, because none of their oxes are being gored. I mean, government is funded to the level they want it funded to. Um, the the PFD is used as the funding mechanism, so there's no taxes, uh, and there's really no spending cuts that are used to uh, resolve the issue. No spending cap uh, that 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 you know restricts uh, future uh, future spending growth, and so the the majority have been have been sort of content to let this ride from year to year to year, and and while they talk a good game about getting a long term resolution, they've really never had any stakes. Um, uh, in the game, they've never really had anything at risk in a way that uh, that, that brings them to the table. This budget, uh, by voting down the CB, by voting down the reverse sweep, we've brought in that we're bringing in the Bush uh, and rural Alaska and and those who care about the college scholarships, really the 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 the, the university crowd. We're bringing them into the game into August. Uh, with with a stake in the game, they want to get those restored. So they're going to be interested in working on a long term fix to 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 you know re restore the the uh, PCE and to restore the college uh, the college scholarship funds. But we've still got a segment out there uh, who uh, can sort of ride can sort of you know still um, uh, ride along on PFD cuts who are more concerned. We've got a segment out there who are more concerned about um, uh, saving the permanent fund, not overdrawing the permanent fund, saving the permanent fund for future use. And, and we've got to bring them into the game also. And this budget, I think, what the minority did by voting down the, the effective date and keeping this budget in the air, I think we have an opportunity to bring in that crowd um, as well. Everybody has got to have a stake in the game when we come to the session in August uh, to resolve this long term. So what what I th I put out a piece yesterday that I that has a three three points that I think uh, are are a good settling point for this budget to get us set up for August. One is a continued vote against the reverse sweep. That's probably not in question. I think those who voted against the reverse sweep are going to continue to vote against the reverse sweep. Um, and so a continued vote against the reverse sweep to incentivize those interested in preserving the PCE and higher ed scholarship programs to come to the table in August. Their, their programs are going to be at risk. They're going to want to find a full resolution, a final, a firm, permanent resolution in August. Um, some, I think, I think a good resolution out of where we are now is some PFD, some permanent fund overdraw 
to incentivize those interested uh, in, uh, in, in preserving the permanent fund, not using the earnings reserve, the per permanent fund overdraws uh, as, a, as, a way of, uh, uh, as a way of getting them to the table using some P uh, permanent fund overdraw. And then uh, a higher PFD, but not, and this is not going to this is not going to set well with the, some listening, but not a full PFD because the, the the higher PFD out of this budget, but not a full PFD because there has to be an incentive for those who want to restore the PFD to get come to the table in August uh, and resolve uh, this issue as well. If we swing from um, full PFD cuts or big PFD cuts, which we've done the last five years, to all of a sudden a full PFD, then those who believe strongly in the full PFD are going to have the upper hand and they're not going to, and, and they're going to be uh, difficult uh, uh, in the negotiations in August. So I think giving sort of everybody, taking a little bit away, taking some away from everybody, the reverse sweep, taking that away so that PCE and higher and the higher ed scholarships are on the table, Taking some out of the out of the permanent fund earnings to increase the PFD, so that those who are concerned about uh, uh, about overdraws, they're interested in coming to the table in August to getting this resolved, and having a higher but not yet a full PFD, uh, so that those who are concerned most about the PFD also come to the table in August. As I say, this budget, this budget, the FY22 budget is not. We can't get to a permanent final solution in the context of the FY22 budget. That has to come uh, in August. And so, in my view, what we really ought to be looking at is getting the FY22 budget in a place where everybody has an incentive. Everybody gets some, but everybody doesn't doesn't get everything of what they want. Things are at risk, so that everybody has an incentive to uh, to come to come to the table in August. August is the key <laughs> right. uh, in trying to get this resolved. Well, what danger do you see here? In because again, this has this smacks a little bit of, well, we, we can't fix it this moment, so we'll fix it later. And I'm not saying, I mean, that's you, you're saying that it can't all be fixed in the next nine days, basically, is what you're saying. Um, and uh, so part of this has to be dealt with in August. But what danger do we have here of kind of this, you know, being the kick the can down the road and, oh, we won't deal with it in August, we'll deal with it next year? I mean, what, what kind of danger do you think is there? I, I, there's a danger of that. I mean, everybody might say uh, coming out of this budget that uh, uh, they can live with what uh, – live on an ongoing basis with, the, with the, you know, the temporary compromises, the ad hoc uh, compromises that, that come out of this budget. But there's going to be people that are motivated. I mean, yeah. if you don't do the reverse sweep and you leave PCE and the higher ed scholarship funds at risk, those people are going to be motivated to find to find a resolution. If you start invading the earnings reserve, if you start doing overdraws of the earnings reserve, some, but set the precedent that that will continue if if we don't get this resolved. Those people who are focused on the on, on, on not doing overdraws will be motivated to come in August. And if you don't have a full P, a, a bigger, but if you don't have a full PFD, those who want to get the PFD resolved will have an incentive to come to the, come to the table in August. And so, yeah, they may sit there in August and go, well, you know, I'm not going to give any more. You got to give. And, and everybody just may sit there with the guns pointed at each other uh, and, uh, and say, you know, we're not going to find a resolution. But to me, Having everybody have a stake in uh, in in August in getting getting things resolved that haven't been resolved and now they're at risk, uh, I think uh, increases the odds of of finally get a, getting a resolution over where we are now. Right, Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Brad, I just want to know why are you so greedy and entitled? <laughs> uh, that's that's kind of the that's kind of the the moment that we're seeing here, and of course the governor's uh, the governor's uh, uh, move yesterday to you want to give me a, a one minute thought here quickly on the governor's move yesterday to try and get the Supreme Court to weigh in on this. Yeah, I'm not sure what he's up to there. It must be it must be that that uh, Matt Larkin's polling is telling him that that uh, he's got to look like he's being reasonable and, and involving the courts in a legal issue. Uh, otherwise, I don't know what he's doing. I wouldn't do it from a legal standpoint. If I were, if I were his legal advisor, I would stand on my reading, on the governor's reading of the of the Constitution, and let somebody sue me if they wanted to. Uh, 
but it's got to be it's got to be some political judgment that they're making that uh, that they need to seem to be reasonable somehow. Well, and there's a danger here because we've seen what the courts have done in the past uh, with that kind of stuff. Specifically, I'm thinking about the Willikowski bill, uh, Willikowski case. Uh, you know, in regards to the PFD, this is not necessarily an electorate that is favorable to a smaller, more limited government. Uh, and so I, I get a little concerned when the governor goes to ask the uh, courts if he can uh, bust the Constitution. Because I, I, I yeah. agree with you, it's pretty clearly written there. Yeah, it's uh, it, I, it, I, there, there's not a legal reason to be doing it. There's got to be a there's got to be a political reason uh, that's motivating them. And, you know, this is a very poll driven administration. So, you know, it could be if the polls are telling them that they need to they need to do this to seem reasonable somehow. So, Brad, why are you so greedy and uh, and and entitled? Uh, your thoughts on uh, on on the rampage on the floor last week by uh, Senator Von Imhoff. Yesterday, we kind of dissected it a bit. We went, in fact, through her whole floor speech, which was quite honestly slightly bizarre. I mean, so full of falsehoods and. Um, and fear mongering. Don't drive across a bridge, Brad, because it may fall down because the government shut down. I mean, it's just there's some crazy stuff in there. Uh, your thoughts on the on the whole tirade? Well, she's running for governor, um, and so you know she thought that was the right pitch to make uh, in her run for governor. She's gonna she's gonna you know claim that Dunleavy is is a, a failed administration, is a failed governor, is not looking out for Alaskans, and she. Senator von Imhoff is is here to save the day, uh, and and you know it starts with not being greedy that everybody has to you know everybody just has to accept that it's going to be a lower PFD and 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 that's all we can afford and we go on from there, and so I would I would guess that in her mind that whole uh, uh, tirade was was done for sound bites that goes into uh, goes into her uh, her campaign for uh, for governor. Um, I, boy, if I was her advisor, I wouldn't have advised her to do that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because there's there's sound bites that are going to come out of that that are going to come back to haunt her. Not the least of which was the hair flip. It, it, uh, it, it isn't part of it isn't part of her speech, but but prior to her speech on gavel to gavel, there's a there's a little you know clip in there or a little piece in there when they were at ease, where she's you know flipping her hair in front of and laughing in front of. Uh, <laughs> Senator Stevens, this is this is, you know, in the lead up, this is before all of a sudden, you know, she's concerned about her father who's home. And 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 I and I'm very sorry for this, but her father who's home dying of of cancer. I mean, she was just all smiles and giggles and, you know, flipping her hair like a like like, you know, a teeny the, the, bopper, the blonde yeah. who went to Harvard. Right. Um, right. Legally blonde. That's it. And uh, and so it, I, it, it was it was staged. Uh, and it was staged for her campaign, and it was staged to appeal to a, a certain segment. But that segment, Michael, is the top 20%. What these people don't get, and we'll get into this in the second segment with the ADN, but what these people don't get is, yes, all their friends are telling them how great they are, and yes, all their friends are telling them, you know, how wonderful they are for, you know, standing up for this stuff and for, you know, talking about, you know, blood in the streets if we don't pass this, pass this budget. But all their they're, 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 it's an echo chamber among the top 20%. They don't, I don't think they appreciate, you know, how this is going to play in the full campaign for people who have been, you know, had their PFD cuts for what would then be seven years. Right. So it's, uh, well, I, you talk about it, sound bites. All I could think of is if I'm running against her, all I'm doing is sound biting that top, that first top of the, uh, top of the rant where she goes, you know, you greedy, and entitled people, and I, then I would pair, then I would you know overlay it with all we were asking for was for you to follow the law. I mean that's exactly it. I mean just over you greedy and entitled people. Oh, you mean the people that wanted the full PFD were greedy and entitled? You know, with your one point four million dollar mansion on uh, out on the lake and and all that. I mean it. It. I think she didn't do herself any favors on this. Oh, I don't think she did either. I don't, but but I would bet that she thinks she did. Yeah, uh, I would bet she thinks that she's laid down the campaign themes uh, that uh, that she's going to follow in the campaign. She laid them down firmly, and you know, and and you, you go to Twitter, or you go to you know various uh, uh, various uh, uh, commentaries, and there are people who you know think she hit a home run with that with that speech. But they're just they're they're existing in their own little echo chamber. 
Um, and I don't know if they're not doing polling or that because they don't have Matt Larkin, they're not doing the right kind of polling, but, but they are, um, <laughs> they're not, they're, they're, that's not going to sell well during the campaign. Uh, but that's, I mean, that's what it was for. That was, that was, that was her campaign speech. Right. Um, we're down to the last uh, minute here. So a couple of people have mo- mentioned that, uh, you know, that technically it wouldn't be an overdraw because even Natasha admits that there's $7 billion in the ERA that shouldn't be there from the past dividend takings. So is it technically an overdraw or is it just, uh, I mean, it's getting back some of the money that's been left in there? Well, all of us talk about, you know, following the law. And the law right now is a 5% draw, and anything above a 5% draw violates that statute uh, and is an overdraw. So, you know, we can all come up with our rationalizations, but if if we are a follow-the-law crowd, which I think we are, that's what the law says. Right. Uh, and the law says it for good reasons. I mean, 5% 5, 5 is, is the, is the after, after inflation real rate of return that – that that most think is uh, is the appropriate uh, appropriate level to draw. So All right. that's what the law says. If you're if you're taking more than that, you're overdrawing. Uh, you, you, true, but there is more money in there. Than there should be. So I'm I'm okay for the overdraw. I guess on that. David asks, why don't you ever, Brad, why don't you ever talk about reducing the footprint of government? Apparently, David has not been listening to the show for seven years because that's all we did for the first five years was talk about reducing the size and footprint of government. And nobody is listening. It, it, it doesn't it just doesn't matter at this point. It's, it's, what, what did you do for me yesterday? What did you what did you say to me yesterday? Uh, I, I'll t- we're not going to talk about this reducing the size and scope of government until the top twenty cent ha- top twenty percent has to pay for part of it. Right. And then all of a sudden, when they have to pay for a part of government, we're going to hear a lot of people talking about reducing <laughs> the size and scope of government. Right. Once they're on the hook for a big chunk of it, instead of just able to pass it off on the lowest income Alaskans, then you'll hear about it. Until then. That's that's it's a hundred percent true. We're continuing now with Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. On to the number two, which has to do with this opinion piece in the ADN from the editorial board, which is, uh, I mean, it's completely disingenuous in my mind. Uh, Brad, what what is your take on this? Give us your thoughts. Well, here's the here's the thing. The ADN editorial board, um, you know, editorial boards generally should be sober, responsible. They are they they should be thought leaders of the community. They should open people's eyes uh, to things uh, and and really seek to educate and inform and and move the discussion forward. This opinion piece, Alaska's budget is a mess. Here's what needs to happen is to use one word, a screed. It is it is just a one sided um, it, it is it is the the written equivalent of Natasha's uh, floor speech It's a one sided uh, 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 screed uh, that's that's claiming that, you know, those who want full PFDs or anything approaching a full PFD or any anything that isn't a leftover P, PFD, her view of a leftover PFD is just, uh, you know, is. They're 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 not uh, responsible citizens, and 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 they're uh, and and they are the the source of all the problems. Here's my problem with the ADN. There are there are decent arguments for for you know why we ought to have a leftover PFD. I think they're all wrong, but there are decent arguments for why we ought to have a leftover PFD. There are also decent, very decent arguments, very responsible arguments for why we have a full PFD. And they begin with the 2016 and the 2017 studies uh, that the economists did of what the effect of PFD cuts are. They have the largest adverse impact on on Alaska families. They are they push most of the cost of middle and lower income Alaska families. They have the largest adverse impact overall using PFD cuts of all the revenue options have the largest adverse impact overall of uh, of uh, on the Alaska economy of, of all the options. Those are responsible concerning factors. Uh, and any reasonable, balanced, uh, thoughtful, responsible uh, discussion of the issue needs to take those into account. It need They need to say why it's important to hurt Alaska families to take the, to use the method or use the approach that has the largest adverse impact 
on middle and lower income Alaska families has the largest adverse impact on the on the overall Alaska economy. They need to discuss why it's important to do that, to have those effects by by cutting the PFD. This screed, this editorial doesn't even come close to mentioning those arguments, doesn't even come close to explaining why uh, we need to why, why we need to take a pro, an approach that has the largest adverse impact on Alaska families and on and on the overall Alaska economy. It's just a one-sided um, uh, 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 propaganda piece uh, that that is that is sitting in this echo chamber, the same echo chamber that Natasha was appealing to in or hoping to appeal to um, in her floor speech, and it's it's not responsive. It's not a responsible. It's not responsible journalism. It's not response. It's not a responsible action by the states. You know, leading. Uh, they hope to be the leading newspaper uh, 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 by the editorial board of the state's leading newspaper. I mean, those editorial boards aren't supposed to be propagandists. They're supposed to be responsible thought leaders, responsible reflectors of of you know what's in the in the in the in the in the best interests of of their readers of their region of their of their state um, and I this just totally fails that so I you know I it, it you got to wonder you know if if the ADN is worth listening to at all on anything if this is the type of position they're going to take uh, on a fund on an issue that's fundamentally important to uh, the Alaska economy going forward. If they're just going to, if they're just going to take, you know, a, a if, if they're not going to deal with the facts as they find them, if they're not going to deal with the impact on the overall community, on the overall economy, on Alaska families, if they're not going to even touch that uh, in in their in their uh, editorial boards, I would expect that out of an op-ed by Natasha. But the editorial board of this publication, if the editorial board of this publication is not even going to touch on those factors, not touch on the Alaska economy, not touch on Alaska families, then you got to wonder what the heck you know. You, you, when when they write an editorial on something you don't know something about, you don't know whether to take that as as useful or not because because you know in this case they're just willing to overlook the basic facts. Uh, and go off on a on a propaganda piece. Well, and what's interesting here is that it, they and they specifically go after certain segments. A breakaway faction of Republicans, based mostly in the Matsu and the Kenai Peninsula, prioritize a supersized PFD. Read statutory here, supersized PFD above all else, and so far be uh, appear to be willing uh, to hold all other elements of the budget hostage in an attempt to get it. I mean, but they don't talk about Stedman's holding hostage different areas, you know, shutting down, not wanting to rebuild schools that have got tilted by the earthquake or, you know, f pulling funding for the most dangerous road in the state or anything else. I mean, it's very blatantly this left, you know, the kind of this this uh, uh, leftover PFD kind of mentality. Uh, and then they go on to talk about like the governor and the 1989 decision under Cooper and the, you know, how it was inconvenient. So they decided to bust it anyway. I mean, it's 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 really blatant in its uh, in its disregard for any kind of equality here. Here's here's what's happening to us. And, and Natasha's floor speech and this are both a piece of it. The top 20 percent are sort of withdrawing into their own bubble uh, and they're con and they're they're talking to themselves and convincing themselves, and you see this out of the Anchorage Economic Development Authority. You see it out of it, it, you see it out of you know the 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 other institutions in the state. They're sort of withdrawing into their own bubble bubble chamber or bubble, and their 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 echo chamber. There we go. Not to mix you know too many things. Echo chamber. They're sort of withdrawing into their own echo chamber, talking to themselves, convincing themselves that this is all right. And, you know, it's just those peons out there that are, that are, you know, wanting, wanting, you know, more money uh, uh, out of, out of, out of, you know, at the expense of, of budget items that they think are good, solid budget items, but that they're not willing to pay for themselves. Um, and, and this top 20 echo chamber is really, I think, you know, causing a huge problem in the state in the sense that we're not trying to pull together. I mean, they, they've, they've sort of pulled in themselves and said, we're not going to pay for this stuff. We're going to push the costs off on middle and lower income Alaska families. And we're right 
in doing that. There's not even any reason to think that we're that we're wrong, that we're absolutely right in doing that. And it's those peons out there, the other 80 uh, percent outside our echo chamber, outside our bubble uh, that are all the problem. That's fine. That's fine for Natasha to say that. That's fine for, you know, politicians who are appealing to their base to say that it is not fine for the state's largest newspaper for the editorial board that's supposed to be responsible and thoughtful and 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 take take everything into account it is not fine for an editorial board uh, to be going off in that direction and i think i think that is the fact they did i think is an indication that the top 20 percent is just you know they're they're pulling together they're closing the the fence and they're saying we're not paying for this stuff we're going to push all the costs off, off on you we're right in doing that you're wrong uh and um uh, and, and and you know sort of this elitist attitude of, of we're not going to listen to it anymore we're just going to tell you we're going to tell you you're wrong and we're going to tell you repeatedly that you're wrong right and I, that's that's just that's just a horrible thing for the editorial board to do absolutely <clears throat> you know you greedy greedy entitled people that's kind of what it all comes down to um uh, the top 20% echo chamber sees the rest of Alaskans as barbarians at the gate. I wouldn't disagree with that. I mean, that, that that's kind of how they see us. Again, we're greedy and entitled. That's, I mean, that is the, that is the snapshot. I keep going back to that. But that is the snapshot of the mindset of these folks. That somehow, because we are demanding that they follow the law, that they follow the intent of the framers of the permanent fund and the permanent fund dividend, that we follow that intent, we are greedy uh, because we want to take away their playthings. We want to take away their access to easy money, and uh, and I think that that's a huge thing. Deshana says, uh, classic approach, uh, Michael. Say something enough, and it becomes reality, right? Uh, speaking of the ADN editorial, I mean that's exactly it. They're speaking to themselves, but they think that they're trying to get this out there, and they think the majority of Alaskans are going to be with them on this. They're trying to speak it into reality, but I don't know if that's selling, uh, other than to the, uh, as Brad said, other than to the top twenty percent. Brad, yeah, it's selling to them. It's selling to to the top twenty percent. I mean, uh, Scooter Kendall, uh, uh, Governor Walker's uh, former chief of staff. Uh, is is on Twitter daily, you know, just you know, praising the ADN for taking this position, praising Natasha for for taking the position, you know, saying that you know people who want jumbo, I think was the word he used yesterday, PFDs uh, are 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 the problem. Well, <laughs> you know, Scooter's in the top twenty percent. Scooter doesn't care about uh, about the PFD. He doesn't he doesn't appreciate the, how important it is to middle and lower income Alaska families and he just ignores the impact it has on the overall Alaska economy because he doesn't want to pay for it. Uh and it's just uh, yeah, they're talking to themselves. It is it is the barbarians at the gate uh attitude. It is the you you peasants just don't understand, you know, what's good for you. Well, guess what? We know what's good for us. We saw it in the 2016 ICER study. We saw it in the 2017 ITEP study. Um, you know, we, there are studies out there that tell us what good, what's good for us. Right. Don't don't <clears throat> don't don't try to sell us something that uh, that 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 is just refuted by the facts. Well, we saw it in the 1999 advisory vote. 83.7 percent of Alaskans said, "No, don't you can't have the dividend for that." Uh, they, I mean, they, they, they know it, but it's just a matter of getting the Alaska voices out there. It's one of the reasons why they've avoided any kind of public advisory vote on any of this stuff, starting back with SB 26 and moving forward, because they didn't want Alaskans on uh, to come back on board with any of this. Yep. It's Kathy Giesel, it's Jennifer Johnson, it's the entire, uh, uh, Natasha, the entire top 20% crowd. We know better than you what's good. Well, but you don't know better than us because the 2016 and the 2017 studies told us what's good. They told us what's good for the overall Alaska economy. They told us what's good for Alaska families. You're just trying. You're just trying to. You, you, I mean, the, the fact that ADN doesn't even address those is just so typical and so telling about uh, about you know how the top 20 percent uh, view the rest of the world. They don't. They they think they don't even need to address facts. 
uh, they just need to, you know, tell us what's good for us and we'll fall in line. Right, right. Which, again, I mean, I think it does play a little bit into our favor uh, with the, uh, you know, kind of the echo chamber. They're not really talking to the rest of Alaska. Uh, you and I were having a conversation yesterday and I said I think that she did some real damage to her political aspirations for governor's office. But you said uh maybe but they they're, they're going to throw a ton of money at her and money is going to be important in this in these upcoming primaries uh tell me your thoughts on that real quick well in in the in the kind of system we've gone to the open primary and the ranked choice voting money's going to play a huge problem we've wiped out parties parties don't mean don't mean much it's going to be how much money you can raise and how much money you can get up on the air with and there and the tw- top 20% and the oil industry and others who don't want to pay for a portion of Alaska government uh, are going to be up with a lot of money to support Natasha. So, I mean, that's, that's what we're going to face. Uh, and, and we're going to have to just keep, you know, focusing on the facts and keep pushing back. But Governor Dunleavy, to be part of that pushback, he needs to come to the table also. He needs to come to the table with responsible revenues uh, that's going to that's gonna close this budget gap. Because if he doesn't do that, they're going to have a solid basis claiming that he's, you know, he he doesn't exist in the real world, and so it's everybody's everybody's got to you know play play their game here, but money's going to be a huge factor and uh, in the in the election, and there is going to be a lot of top twenty percent money uh, behind Natasha. We're going to see her ads over and over and over and over again. Right. Well, she won't win the Matsu. She won't win the Peninsula. She could win parts of Anchorage, which of course is is a big thing, but. Uh, I mean, I think it's going to be it's going to be a hard road for her. I mean, I think she just she thinks she did a good thing, but I think she just made it harder for herself. Uh, and I hope I hope that was the death scream of her campaign, quite honestly. Well, there. she's going to think she's going to she's going to get southeast Anchorage and Fairbanks. True. I mean, true. Uh, is it big enough? We'll have to see. And uh, we'll have to watch. All right. We're down to the last three minutes here. Can you give me a quick synopsis of number three and the budget? The governor's got to come to the table with something. He says it's all whack-a-mole. He says every time he comes to it, they ask him more questions and try and uh, tell him that they want more. But what do you say? Well, they're asking him They're asking him the same question. Governor, what's your idea on how to – on, on the revenues, even your even your budget admits there's a need need for revenues. Your senators, Senator Shower, Senator Hughes, Senator Wilson, tell you there's a need for revenues. Governor, you're the governor. You have a responsibility to propose balanced budgets. What's your proposal for revenues? It's not whack a mole. They're just asking the same question over and over and over, and he's not answering it. And 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 that's just that's. You know, as much as I think the the ADN editorial board is irresponsible, I think that's irresponsible. To get this thing solved, we're going to have to have revenues. To get this thing to get this same thing solved in in August, the governor's got to be part of the conversation. The governor's got to lead. That's what he's elected to do. I know Matt Larkin's telling him, "Oh, don't go out there and talk about revenues. Let the legislature start the talk about revenues, and then you can you know complain about them and and veto them." And but I know that's what Matt Larkin's telling him. But it's not the responsible way to govern. A governor has to govern. Has to propose balance a balanced budget. This budget. Any budget looking forward and or any reasonable circumstances need reven- needs revenues. The governor needs to come to the table. If he doesn't, he's being as responsible, as irresponsible as Natasha is in her way, as the ADN board uh, is in their way. He's got to come to the table before we get to August with, uh, with a proposal on revenues. I'm not going to like it. I know what it's going to be. I'm not going to like it. But at least it will be something. It will be better than PFD cuts which is the default we keep going back to every time we don't have right. we don't have this right. revenue discussion. Right. Well, and with the new budget, do you think he's that he's supposed to put out? Do you think that there will be revenues or not? Oh, Quick. oh heck no. Heck not, no. Not no. <laughs> not in this budget. He's going to he's going to stick to it. But between now and August, now in the August session, he has to come out with revenues or else yep. he's being as irresponsible as Natasha. Brad, thanks so much for coming on board. I appreciate you being part of it today as always, my friend. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. All right, my friends, uh, Brad Keithley, uh, Alaska's for Sustainable Budget. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. 
We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.